Shtetl, the life and death of a small town and the world of the Polish Jews. Next Sunday, February 8th, Olivia Todd discusses his biography of French philosopher and writer Albert Camus. And then author Susanna Lessard talks about her book, The Architect of Desire, Beauty and Danger in the Stanford White Family, a special 24 hours about books beginning next Saturday at 8 p.m. Eastern. Now, Frank Askin talks about his book, Defending Rights, A Life in Law and Politics. For the last 20 years, Mr. Askin has been the general counsel for the American Civil Liberties Union. In the book, he talks about cases he's handled with the ACLU, as well as efforts to access his FBI file and his two campaigns for a seat in Congress. Mr. Askin spoke at the Elliott Bay Bookstore in Seattle. Good evening. On behalf of the Elliott Bay Book Company, I'd like to welcome you and thank you for coming. Um, we're very pleased to have Frank Askin here this evening to discuss his book, Defending Rights, A Life in Law and Politics. For 20 years, Frank Askin has been general counsel of the American Civil Liberties Union. And in 1970, while teaching at Rutgers Law School, where he still teaches, he founded the groundbreaking Constitutional Litigation Clinic, which has produced some of the nation's finest public interest attorneys. He's also served as special counsel to congressional committees and has run for Congress twice himself. Uh, defending rights is a reflection on Frank's 30-year commitment, and a commitment it definitely is, um, to influence the development of public policy, which in essence is influencing the making of law and expanding the rights of individual citizens. It's a wonderful book. I think you'll enjoy it a lot. Frank's going to be discussing and taking questions, so feel free to ask questions. And as usual, we'll have books for sale afterwards, and um, he'll be signing books. Thanks again for coming, and please join me in welcoming Frank Askin. Uh, thank you very much. I uh, really appreciate the uh, invitation from uh, the uh, Elliott Bay uh, Book Company to be here this evening. I'm especially pleased uh, to be here in Seattle, uh, where I must tell you, as a uh, civil liberties lawyer from New Jersey, I sort of feel a special kinship uh, with the uh, legal community in the state of Washington because New Jersey and Washington have both been uh, pioneers uh, in developing uh, state constitutions as a source uh, for the protection of uh, in, in, and enforcement of individual rights at a time when the United States Supreme Court has sort of backed off uh, its commitment to the protection of uh, civil liberties. Um, and Washington and New Jersey, the Supreme Courts of both states have been um, pioneers, as I say, in developing uh, state constitutional protections. Um, in fact, very recently, uh, I won a major victory, free speech victory in New Jersey uh, when the New Jersey Supreme Court um, ruled that the state's um, large uh, suburban shopping malls uh, had to allow free speech, uh, petitioning and leafleting at the shopping malls. And uh, that was a long battle. It took me 11 years to get that case to the New Jersey Supreme Court, uh, where we finally won. But in the meantime, by the time I got there, I was able to rely on a decision of the Washington State Supreme Court in the Alderwood Shopping Center case, uh, where Washington had already uh, declared, unlike the, uh, the U.S. Supreme Court and unlike the Supreme Courts in many states, which have precluded uh, free expression at the shopping malls because they're private property, now in Washington and New Jersey, in both places, these are re, uh, regarded as public forums uh, where people can engage in uh, free speech. And I think there it's a very important victory, uh, particularly for what I call grassroots political expression for uh, poorly financed groups who can't afford the large advertising budgets, uh, electronic media, radio, direct mail, so forth. Most of my book, bulk of my book, Defending Rights, is really a discussion of cases that my students and I uh, have handled uh, for the American Civil Liberties Union uh, through my constitutional litigation clinic at Rutgers Law School, uh, which I started in 1970. And for the last 27 years, that really has been my home base, the uh, clinic at Rutgers, uh, where my students and I practice civil liberties law. <coughs> One of the first cases uh, we handled 
um, was a case against the New Jersey State Police. Uh, it was known uh, colloquially as the uh, case of the long-haired travelers. Uh, back in the uh, early 70s, uh, the time of the hippies, um, the police seemed to get the idea that uh, these young uh, hippie-type looking kids, usually long hair, uh, distinctive appearance, were somehow associated with the drug culture. And the New Jersey State Police clearly had a pattern. Uh, when they'd see um, these long-haired travelers on the state highways, of stopping them, searching them without uh, probable cause. And it was clearly a practice being condoned by the uh, state police and the leadership of the state uh, uh, police department uh, because it was a no-lose situation for the troopers. Uh, the more stops they made, the more illegal stops they made, the more likely it was occasionally they'd find some drugs, they'd make an arrest, and if they made an arrest, they would get commendations and promotions. Meanwhile, if uh, they made 90 or 100 illegal and unconstitutional stops and searches, uh, they were never punished for it. Uh, there was never any sanction. So it was a no-lose situation for them. And uh, we said this, in fact, was being condoned. This pattern of unconstitutional conduct was being condoned. And we brought a suit against the uh, New Jersey State Police and its leadership in federal court uh, to try to put a stop to the practice, seeking an injunction against the New Jersey State Police to make them train their troopers properly uh, to um, um, sanction them when they did make unconstitutional uh, searches. But my favorite client in that case was a young man named Ron, who was a third year undergraduate student at Rutgers College in New Jersey. And during his junior year at college, Ron was actually stopped and searched on 13 occasions by the State Police. Now, Ron was a man of very striking appearance. He had long brown hair that came down to his hips. He had a big, deep, sensitive uh, brown beard fully covering his face, and he had deep, piercing, sensitive eyes. And it seems every time a New Jersey State trooper would pass him in the car, they'd do a double take. They'd say, uh-oh, that looks like trouble. They'd pull him over. They'd pull him out of his car. They'd look in his trunk, in his glove compartment. Never found anything but constantly were harassing Ron. In his senior year, uh, Ron went off to um, Hebrew University in Jerusalem to complete his studies. And while there, uh, he was always looking for odd jobs, pick up a little spending money. And one day he saw an ad in the newspaper from an American film producer who was in Jerusalem to make a documentary film. And Ron figures, well, maybe he can get uh, make a little uh, money here. He shows up, and it turns out they're making a documentary for American television about the life of Jesus. And the producer is looking for Roman soldiers. And the people show up, he says, you, the producer walks down, he says, okay, you over here, you over here, you over here. He comes to Ron. He looks at me, he sees the long flowing brown hair, the beautiful beard, the sensitive eyes. He says, my God, you're Jesus. He pulls him out of the line and he made Ron the star of this documentary film which showed on American network television called The Time of the Crucifixion at Easter time back in uh, the early 70s. Which may just again go to prove the old adage that beauty is in the eye of the beholder. This face, which, for, which ever, seems like for every cop in New Jersey was the face of evil, to this American film producer was the face of the Prince of Peace. Um, anyway, after they made the film, Ron, that we were still on trial uh, in New Jersey in our case, uh, while the film is now being, has been made, and, and now Ron came back to the States to help promote the film. And when he came back, our trial was still going on, and we put him on the witness stand. And I lead him through his 13 incidents. He describes each time where he was going, how the police stopped him, how they dragged him out of his car, how they searched him. And after describing uh, all of this ordeal, I finally said to him, as a result of your experiences, do you now hate all policemen? He says, no, I forgive them. They know not what they do. <laughs> actually, that case, which actually dragged out over a period of seven years, in the back and forth trial courts, appellate courts, three judges died in the course of it. That's a, but that's a long, I tell the whole story, there's a case, chapter in my book called The Case of the Long-Haired Travelers, and I don't go through all the details now. But the case is really a living history of what happened in this country as we moved from the era of the Warren Court 
when this case began to the era of the Rehnquist court when it ended. Because despite Ron's testimony and the testimony of 60 other young men and women who had similar experiences with the New Jersey State Police, this case actually did not wind up successfully. When we started, the, trial, the federal trial judge threw us out of court the first time. We went to Philadelphia to the Court of Appeals. And the Court of Appeals, in a long opinion, said the trial judge was absolutely wrong, that the plaintiffs had an absolute right to seek an injunction from a federal court, that if they could prove the allegations of their complaint, they certainly were entitled to an injunction against the New Jersey State Police to stop this pattern and practice, sent the case back for trial. And we went through this long ordeal of the trial. And we came back to Philadelphia five years later. It took five years to get, I told you about this long judicial history of this case. It took five years to get this case back to um, Philadelphia, to the Court of Appeals. In the meanwhile, a lot of things had changed. Meanwhile, a man named William Rehnquist had joined the U.S. Supreme Court. And after a judge in Philadelphia had issued an injunction against the Philadelphia State Police based on the original Court of Appeals decision in our case, that case went to the U.S. Supreme Court, and the U.S. Supreme Court, in a five to four opinion written by Justice Rehnquist, said, no, federal courts have no business telling state police departments how to organize themselves or to give injunctions against state police departments, invoking doctrines of comity and abstention, and said uh, federal courts had no business issuing such injunctions. So now we went back. After this, we finally get back to the Court of Appeals in Philadelphia, which five years earlier had said, go prove your case, and you have a right to redress from a federal court. And the Court of Appeals wrote another long opinion. Said, well, the plaintiffs did everything we told them to do five years ago. They proved their, all their allegations. But meanwhile, the US Supreme Court has changed the rules of the game. They've changed the law, and we are now helpless. And I'm sorry, there is nothing we can do, and the plaintiffs are without remedy. So I say that sort of, in a nutshell, sort of encapsulates what happened uh, in this uh, era as we moved from a time of the Warren court when the, the, the court said that federal courts everywhere in this country had an obligation and a duty to protect constitutional rights and to provide relief for persons whose constitutional rights were violated uh, to a time when uh, the Rehnquist court was saying nothing doing, uh, don't tell us your troubles. Uh, we don't want to hear it. Uh, one of the reasons why uh, uh, I began to turn my attention from the federal courts to the state courts, uh, where I now do most of my litigating. I uh, keep away from the federal courts as much as possible these days in the light of the new uh, jurisprudence of a much more conservative Supreme Court. Um, speaking of William Rehnquist, uh, who has sort of uh, dogged my professional life uh, for the past quarter century, um, I actually first ran into him in the early 70s when he was merely Assistant Attorney General Rehnquist. But by way of background, let me explain. Long before I went to law school, I was a young radical activist in my native Baltimore. As a teenager, uh, as a young man into my early 20s, uh, I was very active, anti-war, civil rights activities, time when civil rights was not, was not politically correct to be for civil rights. This is before Brown versus Board of Education. And one consequence of my early experiences was I was the target of very uh, continuous and extended surveillance by the Federal Bureau of Investigation. And uh, I now have 500 pages of files which I've obtained under the Freedom of Information Act uh, documenting their uh, extensive um, supervision of my political activities and associations in the civil, early civil rights movement, the pre-civil rights movement. And I detail all of that in chapter one of my book. But when some years later, I went to law school, I didn't enter law school until I was 30 years old, went to law school and started studying constitutional law and learning about the First Amendment and heard of something called the chilling effect 
that certain kinds of government acts, actions have upon individuals' willingness to exercise their rights, their constitutionally given rights of freedom of speech and belief and association. And I began to think, where did the FBI and J. Edgar Hoover get the authority to follow me around all those years when I was a kid and active in political life? Never did anything illegal, never did anything wrong. I was exercising my constitutionally protected rights of freedom of speech and association. Now, where did they get the right to do this? Who gave them the authority to keep tabs on me, to follow me, to keep uh, all these records? When I got out of law school, the first major case I undertook for the ACLU, then I took it for the ACLU of New Jersey, was a challenge to similar practices by the New Jersey State Police, suing on behalf of the Civil Rights and Anti-War Movement in the late 60s uh, to, get the, to make the New Jersey State Police destroy the files they were keeping on local political activists. And lo and behold, I took... I, it was a bit of forum shopping. I went to a state court where I knew the state judge was pretty sympathetic to uh, free speech and constitutional rights. And I actually won a decision from him ordering the state police to burn their surveillance files. And this was a historic decision. Because everybody, J. Edgar Hoover, the FBI had been doing this forever. And suddenly I had a state court judge to say it was actually unconstitutional. It violated the First Amendment for police to do this and vindicated this theory. Uh, which I had developed actually while sitting in co constitutional law class as a student. Now, that decision was short-lived. A year later, the New Jersey Supreme Court said it was premature, judge acted precipitously, sent it back for trial. But meanwhile, the um, National American Civil Liberties Union asked me to bring a similar case against the United States Army. So in 1970, I brought suit on behalf of the ACLU and on behalf of the civil rights and anti-war movement, in the federal district court in Washington, a case called Tatum versus Laird. Laird, you may recall, was then the Secretary of Defense, Melvin Laird, challenging the Army for gathering political data on pol civilian political activists having nothing whatsoever to do with the military. The Army had decided in the mid-60s that Maybe there would be disorders and riots or uprisings in the country, and they should know the enemy. And who was the enemy? It was the civil rights and anti-war activists. And they started keeping files, uh, computer-based files, back at Fort Hollibird with intelligence agents roaming around the country, gathering this information and sending, setting up these dossiers. So I took, uh, I brought this case before the for the ACLU, and um, uh, we we're in the district court, district of Columbia. And the first time around, the judge dismissed the case, gave the grant of the government's motion to dismiss, said he didn't think that, we via, that the Army was violating the First Amendment when they did that. And while we were on our way to the Court of Appeals, who turns up to be the government's main advocate in this case, defending uh, the government and the military, but Assistant Attorney General William Rehnquist. And while our case was pending in the United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia, Senator Sam Irvin, the chairman of the Senate Constitutional Rights Committee, uh, based on the uh, record we, ha we had demonstrated in our case, he was concerned about the Army's domestic intelligence program, and he decided to have public hearings before his Senate committee. And William Rehnquist, Assistant Attorney General, came to um, uh, defend the Army's position, uh, told why he thought the program was perfectly okay, said he knew all about it. In fact, he had all the records in his office. In fact, he said they were even cutting back on it somewhat. They're cutting back. It's not as extensive as it used to be. Had a specific debate with Senator Irvin over the case of Tatum versus Laird, then pending uh, in the Court of Appeals. Said, uh, where I disagree with you, Senator, is that this case of Tatum versus Laird has no business being in the courts. It's nothing for the courts. Uh, it's not the court's business to decide such matters. It's not justiciable. Well, Lo and behold, we won in the Court of Appeals. Court of Appeals ruled plaintiffs have a good claim. They ought to go back and have a right to prove their claim, and if they can prove it, maybe they are entitled to an injunction against the military's domestic intelligence program. Well, the government didn't want to have that kind of trial, and they took the case to the U.S. Supreme Court. And the U.S. Supreme Court agreed to review um, the decision of the Court of Appeals. And since we had won in the Court of Appeals, but a funny, funny thing happened, 
on the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. William Rehnquist got there before me. And when I walked up the steps of the Supreme Court to argue the case, William Rehnquist was sitting behind the bench with a black robe on. Now, if we had won that case four to four, because Re if Rehnquist had recused himself, as he should have in that case, the Court of Appeals decision would have been affirmed, and we would have gone back and had our trial, as the Court of Appeals had suggested. In fact, when I went in the Supreme Court, Senator Irvin, who was, had been so concerned about this program, agreed to be, he filed an amicus brief in the U.S. Supreme Court, and agreed to be my co-counsel. And um, the, the Friday before the, we were arguing the case on a Monday morning, the Friday before, I was sitting with Senator Irvin in his Senate office building office, going over the argument, what he would, which parts he would argue what I was going to do. And as I was leaving, I said, you know, Senator, you know, one more time, you know, we still have time to file a motion to recuse Justice Rehnquist from this case. There had been a lot of earlier discussion. People were a little uneasy about filing such a motion. It had never been done before. The general notion was, well, justices know when they are unfit and it's inappropriate for them to sit. And uh, you don't tell them. They know. Act, they, they're sure. They know what to do. And I said, you know, we still have time to file a motion to recuse Justice Rehnquist. He says, Frank, don't worry about it. He says, I know Justice Rehnquist. He's very conservative. He's a very honorable man. He won't sit on this case. Monday morning, the case is called. Senator Irvin and I walk forward. I said, Senator Rehnquist is still there. He's not, he's, he's not going to participate. He just wants to listen. He won't participate. Of course, the rest is history. We lost five to four. The opinion was written by Chief Justice Berger. It sounded like the testimony of Attorney General Rehnquist before uh, Irvin's uh, committee. And about a year later, I was at a conference in Washington, First Amendment conference, and Senator Irvin was there. And he spots me, comes striding across the room in his North Carolina draw. He says, hollers out, Frank, I sure was wrong about Justice Rehnquist, wasn't I? Well, you know, it's not often that a lawyer does get a last word on the uh, judge after losing a case. I did get a, a bit of that opportunity when um, President Reagan nominated Rehnquist to be the Chief Justice in 1986. Uh, I actually went to testify against that nomination uh, before, um, uh, Senator, or before um, the uh, Senate Judiciary Committee. And I told that story in my testimony. I, it was my, I said that Rehnquist was unfit to be the Chief Justice of the United States, that he was a partisan, result-oriented justice, that he had violated the most basic principle of judicial ethics, that no person can be an advocate and judge in the same case, and that he was totally unfit to serve as uh, Chief Justice of uh, the United States. And I ended my testimony by, with the following. I said, it's just as if Billy Martin had resigned as manager of the Yankees after the sixth game of the World Series and took on the job as um, of umpire for the seventh game. Well, I did get a last word. Of course, uh, Chief Justice Rehnquist has had the last laugh. Despite my testimony, uh, he was confirmed. Um, he's had another decade to uh, help erode our, uh, our constitutional liberties in this country, unfortunately. Um, But despite uh, that setback, uh, I have continued to oppose uh, FBI and police surveillance for the past quarter century in our courts, in Congress, occasionally winning small victories in the courts, some, some, some victories in the legislative arena. For example, the adoption of the Federal Privacy Act by the United States Congress in uh, 1974 uh, an act which I had a, a client at the time I took twice to testify in behalf, uh, in favor of uh, the act. Um, another interesting story I tell him, that was my 15-year-old, uh, uh, so Tatum versus Day was sort of a mega attack on the intelligence agency and s police surveillance. My Lori Payton case was a sort of a mini attack, taking it from the point of view of one small individual caught up in the process. This was a 15-year-old high school student who became the target of FBI investigation because as a home, for a homework assignment, she had written a letter to the Socialist Workers Party. Uh, she was in a political science class where they wanted all the students to find out something about some group on some part of the political spectrum. 
she picked the Socialist Workers Party. The next thing anybody knows, there's an FBI agent out in her small suburban community of Mendham, New Jersey, asking, does anybody know somebody named Lori Payton and why she would be writing to the Socialist Workers Party? Well, it, you know, she was 15 years old. It finally got back. She got the, the agent gets to the high school. Um, that's another long story. That case took seven. That's when we won. Took seven years. Finally got an order that the uh, FBI's mail, that the Postal Service mail cover regulation under which her letter had been intercepted was unconstitutional, that it was unconstitutional for uh, uh, the FBI to use that as a basis for a field investigation, and that she was actually entitled to damages from the FBI, which by then she was 22 years old. It was time for her to go on with her life. We settled the damages for $1. Uh, we we uh, declared victory and, uh, and quit. So there were some, some victories along the way. Um, uh, one of the strange uh, twists um, uh, in this story, in fact, uh, you know, part of what we've done, I think, even though we've, the, the, the judicial victories are sort of few and far between in this effort to stop uh, uh, political surveillance, we have, in fact, I think, discredited the practice in the public's mind. Uh, every time the FBI gets caught engaging in this kind of activity uh, again, um, they always apologize, so they won't do it anymore. Of course, they do till they get caught the next time. But uh, uh, we have, they, they recognize now it's something they're not supposed to be doing. The public won't tolerate it. I mean, even, Repu even conservative Republicans, uh, as a result of Filegate, uh, are now are uh, beginning to have questions about uh, the propriety of the FBI's uh, collection and uh, dissemination of materials and how people exercise their uh, um, First Amendment uh, uh, rights. Um, but in, in, in one extraordinary twist of fate, uh, after I lost uh, my second attempt uh, congressional race in 1986, I wound up, starting in 1987, as special counsel to the House Government Operations Committee on issues of civil liberties and national security. Um, so suddenly, because the, uh, the Government Operations Committee had oversight jurisdiction over all of the federal intelligence agencies, the FBI, the CIA, the National Security Administration. So suddenly I have oversight jurisdiction over these various agencies that had been overseeing my political activities a quarter of a century before. Uh, uh, you know, astounding uh, twist of uh, fate. Um, one of the things that uh, um, that experience emphasized to me was sort of the way in which government bureaucrats have turned our constitutional system on its head. Uh, they uh, seem to believe that they have a right to spy on us, the people. Our um, we're their employers. They're our employees, the federal bureaucrats. They, they think they have an absolute right to spy on us and keep information on us. But then they think they have a right to keep the public business secret from us. They have so many, you know, secret, everything is classified and confidential and secret, and you want to find out what's going on in the government. Even Congress has a hard time trying to find out half the time uh, what the uh, administration is doing. Um, during my period as congressional counsel, uh, we did one hearings on government secrecy, and the CIA, just to show you how bizarre this whole situation is, the CIA um, sent uh, a representative to testify, and the chairman, is asking him about, um, you know, why can't we, you know, have more, uh, uh, can't we release more documents? You've got all these billions of documents classified. What are we going to do about some openness of what the government's been doing all these years? And the spokesman has got all the things. Oh, he says, we're changing. The CIA is changing its ways. We now even have a task force on openness, which has just filed a new report. And everything's going to change. And the chairman says, fine. Would you submit a copy of the report to the committee? He, oh, he says, no, I can't. It's classified. <laughs> So, you know, it's sort of an Alice in Wonderland world when you try to deal uh, uh, with the uh, federal um, intelligence uh, agencies. But let me sort of, in conclusion, I want to have some time. We have some questions here. Just say, despite my long battle with the intelligence community, I really must confess that FBI files are not always all that bad. They sometimes can come in handy. Let me give you an example. When I was working uh, as congressional uh, consultant, I had to file for security clearance. Now, when you file for security clearance, among other things, you have to list every job you've ever held and every address at which you've lived. Now, any of you who are over 50 years old, think back. 
people move a, move a lot, change it. Think about God trying to figure out the street address of every place you ever, it's hard enough to remember the streets, let alone the, the numbers. But you know what? I had it all at my fingertips. It was all in my FBI file. <laughs> I just opened my files and gave it all back to them. I said, well, you said in such and such a year, I moved from such and such an address to such and such an address. And it's good, if that's good, if that's what you think, it's probably right. I'm not gonna argue with you. So sometimes FBI files can come in very handy. And since authors I know are supposed to read a segment from their books, let me conclude also by reading from the opening page of my book. This is how it begins. Johnson had Boswell. I had the Federal Bureau of Investigation. When one is trying to reconstruct events that occurred as much as 45 years ago, it is a great convenience to have contemporaneous reports of trained FBI agents. Not that they are always, always accurate or all complete, they tend to be subjective and episodic, but they are still an invaluable source, an example. On our 30th anniversary, my wife decided to take me on a mystery drive. When we passed the sign, welcome to Harrison, New York, I realized she was retracing the <coughs> the path of our elopement. However, when we reached our destination, the only thing either of us could remember was that the justice of the peace had been named Venezia. Despite driving around town for about 45 minutes, we could find no house that looked familiar. The telephone book listed no Venezias, and no one at the police station could remember him. We began to think maybe he was an imposter. We'd never been properly married. My wife's mistake was not having told me in advance where we were going. If she had, I could have consulted my FBI file. A belated, a belated search revealed, as I had suspected, that the FBI knew all about Justice of the Peace Venezia. His name was Charles, and we had been married in his living room at 3 Calvert Street on August 6, 1960. No, the FBI did not accompany us on our elopement. Agents discovered a report of the event after the fact on the New York Times social page, which listed the names of my new in-laws. A telephone call to my mother-in-law by an agent posing as an old friend from Baltimore provided other re relevant details for the FBI's insatiable files, including the revelation of a proud mother that her daughter was attending a graduate school at Columbia University under a scholarship. So there, you see just how handy FBI files do sometimes come in. And just to demonstrate that, you know, I really, despite my battle with the FBI, with the intelligence agencies, I just want to demonstrate I really do not have any hard feelings. I don't take it personally. And I want to read you, in conclusion, a letter which I've recently received. It says, Dear Frank, Thank you for writing. It was a pleasure to hear from you. I appreciate the invitation to attend your book party here in Washington and regret I am not able to join you. Let me offer belated congratulations on the publication of your book, Defending Rights, A Life in Law and Politics, and also thank you for sending me an inscribed copy. As for the other matter you raise concerning my grade in your class, I think I will refrain from waiving my privacy rights, thereby giving you a much better story to tell. Sincerely yours, Louis J. Free, Director, Federal Bureau of Investigation. Now, I didn't, I didn't uh, teach Lou Free constitutional law, but I did teach him civil procedure. Thank you. Questions about law or politics? I'm happy to respond to any. Oh, Can you talk a little bit about your experience with the Contragate uh, scandal and, and your involvement in investigating that? Well, I, I was sort of on the fringes of Contragate. When I got, when I got to Washington, it, um, I have a, book, a chapter in my book called Tales of the, Na of Na Tales of the National Security State. Uh, and I talk about the Iran-Contra investigations and a bunch of other related uh, 
issues involving uh, so-called national security and uh, civil liberties, which I dealt with when I was working uh, for Congress. Um, but I was sort of on the fringes of uh, Contragate. Um, it's hard, you know, it's, 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 it's sort of a speech of, it, of, of itself. I sort of have to refer you to my book or to the, you know, there's a wonderful new book by uh, Lawrence Walsh, the, uh, who was a, a magnificent, uh, what a hero uh, of, of American politics he is, the special prosecutor in, uh, in, in Iran Gate, um, who stood up to every challenge. You know, he was a conservative Republican. He was a member of the federal judiciary. He resigned, he took the appointment, and he did, tried to do just a basic, decent, honest job and uh, was attacked at, from every angle. Uh, he would refuse to back down. His book is a wonderful uh, explanation of the, the, really what was done in Iran Gate, how the, our constitutional system was so undermined uh, by the White House. Um, it was just uh, you know, an egregious uh, um, episode in American history, what uh, Oliver North uh, and all his cronies did from the White House in uh, subverting uh, the Constitution and undermining and uh, defying every uh, thing that Congress was trying to do to put an end to the war in uh, Central America. Uh, it, it's just an incredible story. But I think, I'd, I, rather than go into it in any great detail, I think I'd better refer you to uh, the chapter in my book, which also re refers you back to uh, the Walsh uh, book. Um, do you suppose any of us don't have an FBI file? <laughs> well, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I suppose some people don't. Uh, I mean, there are many millions. Uh, you know, one of the terrible things is that, um, you know, Congress, in 74, Congress actually passed the Federal Privacy Act. And the purpose was to make J. Edgar Hoover destroy all his files. Because it had been exposed, there had been all this exposure. Hoover had files on millions of Americans who, you know, honest, law-abiding people just because he didn't agree with their politics. And Congress passed the Privacy Act, which said that, con that the no agency, no federal agency, the, and as, as far as anybody knows, the FBI is a federal agency, could maintain, uh, uh, could collect, maintain, use, or disseminate any information describing how individuals exercise their rights under the First Amendment, except when um, pertinent to uh, an authorized law enforcement investigation. Now. Everybody thought that meant the FBI had to destroy its files. That's what it was Congress thought. Those files were never destroyed. I have filed a number of lawsuits. Other people have filed lawsuits. Unfortunately, those lawsuits are all decided now by federal judges appointed by Reagan and Bush uh, who side with the FBI. Sort of, they, they have sort of this catch-22 uh, argument. First of all, they say anything we did is an authorized law enforcement investigation by definition because we're the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Therefore, it's authorized, and therefore, we can do whatever we want. And, and largely, the, um, uh, the federal courts have let them get away with that. Uh, there's a new ACLU case actually out of Illinois, done by our, uh, the ACLU's Illinois affiliate, just lost in the, the D.C. – actually, was, it was tried in the D.C. Court of Appeals. I'm not quite sure why, but it was done by our Illinois affiliate. They just lost it, D.C. Court of Appeals, in a two-to-one decision, a wonderful dissent by uh, Judge Tatel. Again, upholds uh, – the FBI's right to maintain, they say, the, this court says, once they collect them, they can maintain them. But the law clearly says you can't ma collect or maintain without reason. They said, no, as long as they, they were collected, okay, and nobody objected to the collection in this case. The case actually brought by Lance um, Lindblom, former director of the MacArthur Foundation, uh, who discovered they had some files on him. He didn't object that they originally collected it. He said, why don't you destroy them now? You've got no more reason to keep them. And they agreed there was no reason to keep them, but they didn't want to destroy them. And uh, the Court of Appeals said that's perfectly fine. There's now a new pe a petition for certiorari now pending before the U.S. Supreme Court in that case. I must tell you, I have mixed feelings. I'd love to see the Supreme Court take that and, and, and um, you know, uh, redeem the Federal Privacy Act. The problem is I'm afraid they'll take it and uh, they'll just uh, write another terrible opinion to, and, again, uh, further eviscerate uh, the Privacy Act. Um, but uh, there are still many too many files. Uh, never, as far as I know, they've never destroyed those old uh, Hoover files. They're still there. Uh, best you can do is uh, write under the Freedom of Information Act to see if they're keeping a file. Now, they'll tell you if they're keeping a file. They may sometimes, uh, cons they'll give you some of it. They may conceal some parts of it. Uh, my large parts of my files are blacked out. Uh, they claim exemptions for certain information. Um, but at least you can get uh, and find out if you have a file. And when you write, you tell them, and if you don't have a file, don't start one based on this letter. 
the article in yesterday's New York Times about um, the expansion of police rights to go to medical, medical records? Medical records, yes. In fact, there's another piece in today's New York Times. Yeah, there's a new piece. It's a sort of a, a more expanded piece today. Um, the administration is now trying to claim that they are, you know, that yes, it was a little bit misleading, that they are going to have protections in there, but it's unclear what those protections will be. Uh, I mean, it's this whole question of trying to protect any shred of personal privacy in this age of runaway technology is a very serious uh, issue. National ACLU has a uh, committee, in fact, the committee is chaired by uh, uh, the, the national board member from uh, Washington, Phil Beriano who's chairing the special national uh, board committee on um, new, to develop new policy of how can we possibly protect individual privacy uh, against all these threats of technology when everything you know, about you is, sort of can be, is, is available to almost anybody in an instant and can immediately be disseminated to the entire world over the internet. It's a very daunting task to figure out how we're going to do it. And health records are the, you know, probably the most uh, um, difficult, you know, are the most uh, dangerous aspect of it when people can find out your intimate, de intimate details of your medical records. And it's certainly a very serious problem. And it's going to take, a, that's going to take a big political battle, I think, to try to make Congress to do something uh, right um, in this regard. And certainly the AIDS, it's a major issue for the ACLU. Now, Monica? Uh, have you been following any of the local news? We're about to have a special session of our legislature for one day so they can add four words and allow people's uh, warrants to be looked up uh, if they happen to be jaywalking. To do what if they're jaywalking? They can look up warrants against them no. if they're jaywalking. Is this, this isn't one of your initiatives, is it? This is just a... No. I come out here, oh, I hear about our initiatives. I've been in Oregon and Washington. I'll hear about, about initiatives out here. Our state Supreme Court oh. just threw out the police right to do this. Oh, I see. And they so want to restore they want Well, may, the state Supreme Court didn't say it would be unconstitutional, huh? They, but put, if they base it on, on constitutional grounds, then there's nothing the legislature can do. Um, so I take it, so your st state Supreme Court, at least, is still pretty uh, uh, good in protecting rights when they can. Are they, are they wavering Very a little? Surprised. Oh, okay. <laughs> New Jersey, we're, we're in great, great shape. I love being, I'm, one of the great things living in New Jersey, we have a wonderful Supreme Court uh, who, who love the Constitution. I wish you uh, had, uh, did as well. Uh, uh, another very serious problem, at least in the minds of some of us, is the influence of money in politics. And some of us are somewhat uh, disturbed by the ACL's purity. That's my mind. And uh, they're, they're concerned about restrictions on freedom of speech. I wonder if the ACLU has ever been concerned about the restrictions of poverty on freedom of speech. Should not the ACLU perhaps be taking some legal action to ensure that poor people can have equal free speech? Well, one thing at a time. Um, I do agree with you uh, that the ACLU policy on political campaign speech is wrongheaded. I've been arguing that point in the national board for 20 years. Um, if you ex for, forgive the expression, in one of our debates, um, I made the point, I said there's an old uh, street saying that money talks and bullshit walks, but I don't know why we have to elevate that to constitutional principle. Um, I think the ACLU is wrong. Um, and there's a substantial minority within the organization that agrees with me, but it is a minority. We have uh, debated on a number of occasions. The ACLU basic policy is money is speech and that there should not be, and if you restrict the amount a person can contribute, or even an organization or a corporation can contribute, or the amount that candidates can spend, you are restricting speech. Uh, I think it's the wrong policy. At this moment, I happen to be the chair of a special ACLU committee to revisit our policy, whether it will come up with anything that will pass, become a majority position on the national board, I don't know, but we are in the process of at least reviewing it again. Now. Having said that, I must also tell you, I'm very skeptical that there's any way to change the situation. And I'll tell you, there are three problems. One is the United States Supreme Court. Uh, United States Supreme Court doctrine, to a large extent, mirrors current ACLU policy. That um, 
with some exceptions, that money is speech and you can't restrict it, except for the narrowest of reasons. So even if certain laws were passed, the Supreme Court would probably rule them unconstitutional. The second problem is incumbents. Incumbents don't really want to change anything. They're happy with the way the system is, and they're the ones that have to make the changes. And the third problem is the real solution, and here the ACLU is in, it, and I are, are in total agreement, that the real answer is public financing. And the ACLU does believe in massive public financing. Now, where I disagree at, uh, with ACLU policy on this is the ACLU then says, but candidates should be able to raise additional funds in addition to the public funds. I think if you had public funding, you could then say that's all you get. You accept public funds, you can't raise any more. But if we had massive public financing, I mean, for a congressional campaign, it might mean a million dollars a candidate. Uh, and if you had that, maybe it wouldn't make a lot of difference. You had an optimal amount of money to run as a candidate. Maybe it's not even worth knocking yourself out to go raise another million because there does come a point where additional money is not going to help you that much. As long as you have sufficient money to get out that message, you have an op a maximum uh, you know, floor there, a million dollars, a million two, whatever it is, I think that could work. But the public is never going to buy that. We have a tax cut. Uh, it's, it's a little state, it's, it's, it, and even half that law is going to be probably declared unconstitutional. But they're talking about piddling amounts of money. If we talk about, I don't believe taxpayers are ever going to permit Congress to spend the, the billions of dollars that would really be necessary to have a, a serious public financing system. And because of that, incumbents have a perfectly valid excuse not to do it. They well, our, our, our constituents don't want that. Why should we do it when our constituents are against it? So I, I find this situation so intractable that I really have no confidence that we're going to resolve anything anytime soon. Now, Bill Bradley, who I think is a sincere man, a serious man, he says we got to have to amend the First Amendment to do anything. Now, and th I, that I can't support because the, 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 the cure may be worse than the disease. I don't like fooling with the First Amendment. So it's a really difficult, tough problem. I wish I could say I see some light at the end of that tunnel. I really don't. And even if the ACLU, you know, say change its policy, uh, I'm not sure it would have any significant meaning on anything. Yeah. Well, tie that, your point, and your view on the free speech and money to the subpoenas that are going out to the nonprofit organizations with the campaign finance investigators are looking at what nonprofits are doing and their role in the campaign and don't you see the closer connection between free speech and money well I'm not sure on which that would argue that there should not be restrictions that in fact is you know that's, that's part of the that's part point. of the national ACLU argument that if you have restrictions you're going to have government interfering with what people are doing and how they're spending their money and there's a lot of truth to that there are problems with giving the government um, power to oversee the expenditures of political money, because once they have that power, it can be abused. It's not an easy s solution. But it's being abused right now. There are subpoenas going out to a, a wide range of nonprofit organizations, including the ACLU. No, I don't know of any subpoenas to the ACLU over well, the campaign. On NPR yesterday morning, that uh, in fact the ACLU, along with a number of other groups, were fighting the subpoenas. Well, the ACLU may be, may be defending some groups that are, have been subpoenaed. The ACLU has never not been subpoenaed well, to my knowledge. It doesn't matter if the ACLU received the subpoena or not. Well, the ACLU doesn't spend political money. The ACLU doesn't involve itself in uh, electoral politics well, at all. We argue, but ACLU yeah. publishes information on candidates' points of view yeah. about First Amendment issues. But that's all clearly protected by the Constitution. Uh, issue advocacy, I mean, the problem is it, uh, it's the... the um, um, permission viewed as a campaign expenditure from people who are against the ACLU position. Well, it, but those cases have been easily won. There's no problem winning those cases. The courts keep saying that uh, uh, you can't uh, stop or nonprofit organizations or any organizations from engaging in issue advocacy, and uh, those rules are pretty clear. In fact, one of the problems would become even if we had a strict public financing system. The problem would remain that you couldn't stop independent groups from spending money independently. 
so that sure, if even though you had you limited the amount a candidate could receive and spend, and they they could only say spend what they get from public uh, from the public uh, treasury, you would still have other groups like the whether it's the National Rifle Association or uh, Right to Choose uh, or other uh, um, you know ideological groups. They could go out and spend independently money to elect candidates, and in fact, it would probably increase um, their power in the electoral process. Maybe that's good, maybe it's bad. Uh, maybe there's nothing wrong with that. Um, so there are, you know, there are a myriad of problems here. And under the best of circumstances, it's, it's a, this is a, you know, a very, very complex and difficult problem. Uh, but I agree, you can't stop nonprofit groups from spending money on issues. At times there have been some slight efforts to do that, but the courts have quickly uh, knocked those uh, attempts down. Uh, in fact, the ACLU was, uh, at once upon 20 years ago, the ACLU was charged with alleged violations because it was uh, sponsoring uh, newspaper ads for the impeachment campaign to impeach uh, Nixon. And the ACLU was challenged and that it was political money, but that was quickly knocked down. And that has not been a serious problem uh, since uh, that time. It's clear that uh, advocacy groups can spend all the money they want on issue, on issue with, the, on, uh, you know, uh, educating the public about issues, even if it, though it might have some connection to a candidate. Society as a whole, when they choose issues they're going to pursue, um, I think I may be speaking for the more conservative part of the group. I'm not quite sure what explain what you mean by that. Oh, I know what you mean. You're talking like communitarian point of view. No, I'm just talking about when you get hard over on protecting individual rights. Just to my view, it's a pendulum, and, and the pendulum now seems to be swinging back toward the rights of the group as a whole. As You know, the ACLU is criticized by what's called the communitarian movement, which I think is sort of the, their guru is um, um, Etzioni, uh, the sociologist, uh, who's sort of the leading communitarian, uh, who says the ACLU is not concerned enough with the rights of the whole as opposed to the rights of the individual. Well, the ACLU has put its uh, resources basically on the side of the individual to be at the center. Uh, to protect individual rights. Now, obviously, there are, you know, there are certain things individuals are, cannot be allowed to do, uh, even though they'd like to do it, because it has such serious consequences uh, for uh, other people. Um, but that's a question of uh, where do you draw the line? The ACLU tends to draw that line much more on the, fa on the side of the individual, saying, look, government has to demonstrate some very strong community interest in order to prohibit this particular kind of conduct. Uh, just because some people think that certain literature is obscene, uh, and some people think it may have some impact on how other people behave, there's never been any proof of that. And we believe it's the right of the individual, even though the majority don't want that kind of literature to be distributed. Uh, the ACLU's position is, until there's uh, you know, overwhelming evidence that really it does harm, real harm, to uh, other people, uh, the in right of the individual has to be protected. Uh, that's always where, you, where the ACLU comes down. Um, you know, as I say, as I told you before in my story, a beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Uh, you know, some of us see the Fourth Amendment, uh, which prohibits unreasonable searches and seizures by government agents, as a wonderful protection for individuality and privacy. Other people see the Fourth Amendment as a shield for criminals. Um, now, and I suppose, you know, if police had the right to search anybody they wanted or walk into anybody's house they wanted, they'd probably find some bad people and some bad conduct and uh, stop some crime. The question is, are we willing to give up our liberty uh, for a little bit more safety? 